Hello, my name is Tony. A fistful of dynamite was Spaghetti Western maestro Sergio Leone's penultimate directing gig in 1971. It would be nearly 12 years before he would take to the director's chair again for his final outing, the gangster epic Once Upon a Time in America. During those years, he worked as a job in producer and on several personal projects that failed to come to fruition. The problem with being a visionary artist in the film industry is if no one else shares your vision enough to bankroll it, you either sell your soul with compromise or you fucked. I don't think Leone was a big fan of compromise. This film had three core titles and depending on where in the world you lived you would experience it under one of them. I saw it as a fistful of dynamite in the UK, America and other territories got it as duck you sucker and here and there it was also known as once upon a time the revolution. Personally, I'm not a fan of any of these titles. Two are blatant cash-ins and one sounds resolutely dumb and unappealing. A fistful of dynamite refers back to a fistful of dollars, but anyone expecting a continuation of the man with no name, legend and character are going to soon feel rather misled, maybe even cheated. Once Upon a Time, The Revolution suggests something of a sequel to Once Upon a Time in the West, again misleading. Some armchair spaghetti scholars imagine it to be the second entry in a Once Upon a Time trilogy, ending with Once Upon a Time in America, but I don't think that was Leone's intention at all. Finally, Duck You Sucker has nothing to do with wildfowl as some might mistakenly think. No one says, hey, look at that albatross, to receive the response, that's no albatross, it's a duck you sucker. Nope. It's a line James Coburn's character routinely spins out just before something blows up. Fine in the context of the on-screen action, but it's a crappy and sloppy title all the same and would do little to effectively inform or attract audiences, in my opinion. However, even though I saw it as a fistful of dynamite, I'm going to refer to it as Duck You Sucker. Why is that, you ask? I mean, you do, don't you? Well, simply because it's a standalone film, not a sequel or continuation of any previous movie, and as such should have a standalone title that is not a bare-face market employee. Duck You Sucker fits the bill. Duck? Bill? Get it? Ah, please yourselves. Philistines. The production was beset by upheaval and conflict throughout. Leone's collaborator, Sergio Donati, began the screenplay during the production of Once Upon a Time in the West. The main theme being the deconstruction of romanticized perceptions of revolution and revolutionaries. To this end, it was set during the Mexican Revolution, as good a place as any. Leone had no intention of directing it. He chose Peter Bogdanovich. Bogdanovich lasted about 10 minutes before jacking it in, feeling he would have little directorial control. Next up, Sam Peckinpah was approached but turned it down as you'd expect of Sam, like why would he want to be produced by a fellow director? Leone then brought in his own assistant director Giancarlo Santi, who he would supervise and support. Leone and Donati had conflicting ideas about the scale of the picture. Donati saw the project as a modestly budgeted action thriller, whereas Leone visualised it as a more sweeping and grandiose affair like The Good, The Bad and The Ugly and Once Upon a Time in the West. Casting it came with his own problems and issues. The role of IRA explosive expert John Mallory was intended for Jason Robards, who had played Cheyenne in Once Upon a Time in the West. Eli Wallach was under contract to play the Mexican bandit patriarch Juan Miranda, a virtual facsimile of his role as Tuco in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. The studio, spotting an opportunity to exploit, wanted Robards replaced by Clint Eastwood. Eastwood, however, now making successful American films such as Hang'em High, was actively distancing himself from his spaghetti western past and moving on. He turned it down. The part was then offered to George Lazenby, who declined, and Malcolm McDowell, which went nowhere. In the end, James Coburn took the gig. Everything was set with Coburn and Wallach until the studio threw a spanner in the works. Turns out Rod Steiger was under a contractual obligation to star in a picture for them. They insisted on Steiger for the role of Juan. Wallach, who had dropped out of another movie to take part as a personal favour to Leone, was unceremoniously kicked off the project and instantly sued for compensation, as you would. Steiger came with his own set of demands, like there's a surprise, the main one being he wouldn't perform unless Leone directed it, and therefore under pressure from the studio, Leone reluctantly agreed. Steiger got what he wanted, and throughout the production he and Leone proceeded to clash continuously with Steiger repeatedly storming off set, it is alleged.
It's the Mexican Revolution, but low-life peasant bandit Juan Miranda Rod Steiger is less than impressed. He's more interested in robbery with his extended family who form the core of his gang, blagging his way onto an elite stagecoach, the passengers of which are from the upper echelons of society. He accompanies it into an ambush in which the driver and guards are killed and the passengers relieved of their valuables and dignity. He rapes the only female passenger, one of those mysterious fully clothed rapes, and dumps them all in the middle of nowhere. Heading off with a stolen coach, the brigands run into motorcycle riding ex-IRA bomb maker John Mallory, James Coburn. Mallory is on the lam from the British authorities and headed for a job at a silver mine. Juan has a dream of robbing the city bank in Mesa Verde. He quickly comes to view Mallory and his expertise with explosives as the key to realising his aspirations. When Mallory is disinclined to go along, Miranda frames him for the murder of his potential silver mine employers and thus coerces is his compliance. In Mesa Verde, Mallory contacts a band of revolutionaries led by Dr. Vallega, Romulo Valley, to enlist his aid in taking the bank. An attack by the rebels will make a fitting distraction, whilst Miranda and his family perpetrate the robbery. All goes well, Mallory's explosives breach in the bank's defences, until Miranda finds no money or valuables inside, because it's being used instead as a secret holding tank for political prisoners. As he is responsible for freeing them, he automatically becomes a very unwilling hero of the revolution. With the rebels on the run from the Federales or Mexican army led by Colonel Gunther Razor Antoine St. John, a ruthless fascist in a tank, Mallory and Juan stay behind on a mountainside with heavy-duty belt-fed machine guns and explosives to take out a key bridge across a gorge and of course butcher as many of the troops as possible. When they make it to the cave system where the rebels are holed up, they find them all dead, including Miranda's father and sons. The army had got there first. Grief-stricken, Miranda takes a machine gun and confronts the surrounding army single-handedly, whilst Mallory makes a break for it. Later, Mallory observes Dr. Vallega betraying the rebels to Razor in return for his own life. The rebels are killed by firing squad. A captured Miranda is also due to face execution in the same manner, but armed with dynamite, Mallory intervenes and and the two escape. Ending up on a rebel train with a train full of federales led by Razor approaching fast from the opposing direction, Mallory hatches a scheme to drive a locomotive engine packed with explosives into the oncoming armed convoy. He takes the treacherous Dr. Vallega along with him and the scene is set for a very incendiary climactic confrontation between the rebels and the government forces. What do we have for entertainment? It's a Sergio Leone spaghetti western that is more divisive than his previous works. Some fans love it and think it an overlooked masterwork. Some perceive it as a misstep and a poorer reflection on his classic 60s output. For me, it's not that simple. When is it ever? And although there are things in it I could well do without, there are others that convince me this is some of his most striking and thoughtful work. I'll start with the two main characters who are more nuanced and complex than usual. One, Miranda, may be a base and violent peasant bandit, but he has a raw intelligence and strong familial relationships. Rod Steiger seemingly convinced himself he had a talent for accents, probably based on his stellar characterization of the traumatized death camp survivor in The Pawnbroker. He brought that character so fully to life that you can almost forgive him his misplaced self-belief. Almost. His Mexican accent is truly dreadful. An exaggerated pantomime turn that drives serrated plutonium rods of sonic discordance into your eardrums. In general, he's over the top and down the other side of the mountain. And then, on occasion, he delivers moments of poignant emotional gravitas and precision in certain scenes. Miranda's grief at the deaths of his children is almost palpably conveyed, with a quiet and seething angst that reminds just how fucking good Steiger could be when he wanted to be. Talking of accents, Coburn's Irish lilt tunes in and out and wanders about the place like his primer was the Finian's rainbow guide to leprechaun impressions. He does, however, make a cool and haunted anti-hero. What's he haunted by? Flashbacks to his life in his homeland, mostly. Well, aren't we all? We'll get on to those. Duck You Sucker is probably Leone's most politically charged film. At the time it was conceived, student activist riots and protests in Paris resonated with revolutionary fervour, and Italy was re-evaluating and coming to terms with its fascist past. The second element may have been influential on the character of Razor, who wouldn't have looked out of place in a Nazi uniform leading a blitzkrieg in his tank in a World War II flick like Battle of the Bulge. 
Leone proposes to demythologize the romanticism of revolution. Miranda sees it as a futile cycle whereby the poor like him and his kin remain forever poor and at the bottom of the food chain, whoever is in power. He has no illusions, no ideals, and his worldview is non-politicized. The deaths of his family members send him on a revenge mission, resentful of and despising his new status as a hero of the revolution. He doesn't want it, doesn't believe in it, it means nothing to him. It's a another lie and revolution is just another con game. The upper class passengers on the stagecoach he robs at the start of the film shovel fine food and drink into their faces and express their bigotry and contempt for the poor peasantry whilst he must sit there and listen as though he doesn't exist as a sentient being. His kind are described as filth, animals, degraded, bestial. It's Leone's savage critique of a social hierarchy that abhors in the extreme those it sees as an altogether alien and inferior species to themselves. These people are so obnoxious and hateful, you almost can't wait for them to get what's coming to them. Mallory has participated in revolution before in his motherland. He's sceptical, doubtful, has had more than enough of it. However, he reads books on political philosophy, which espouse theories of social evolution and the valid role of revolution and class conflict in that process. He still has an interest and becomes more readily involved than Miranda does. Leone explores the subject of betrayal. Dr. Vallega, captured and tortured by Razor, rolls over on his comrades, identifying them and thus condemning them to death to save his own skin. In a flashback to his life in Ireland, Mallory is the victim of a similar betrayal. His best friend Nolan, David Warbeck, a fellow nationalist captured by English soldiers and beaten, points him out in a bar. Mallory shoots the two soldiers and his friend dead, the event that caused him to flee to Mexico as a wanted man. In terms of vision and scope, it's sincerely ambitious, with plenty of action, momentous explosions, and a panoramic sweep that borders on the epic. Effectively, harking back to the good, the bad and the ugly and once upon a time in the West. You get a quirky and playful score from Ennio Morricone underpinning it all, with his eccentric trademark vocalizations and some plaintive pastoral stylings, all heart tugging strings and woodwind. The original cinema cut was choppy, sometimes incoherent, smacking of studio interference in the editorial process. The restored version I more recently watched runs for over two and a half hours, holds the narrative together more cohesively, but slows down to a crawl on times. To a large extent, this is due to the flashback sequences of Mallory in Ireland. They're silent apart from Morricone's music, languid, protracted, and filmed in the slowest slow motion imaginable. Mostly, they depict a triangular relationship between Mallory Nolan and a young woman, Colleen Vivian Chandler. Seems the two men were porking the same chick. Probably not at the exact same time, but you never know. These boring vignettes are largely superfluous and drag like a motherfucker. Ireland is rendered as a soft, focused and idealised pastoral heaven, antiseptically clean, as the trio drive in a motor car, frolic through the countryside and playfully laugh, tease and interact with each other, moving like they're immersed in a dreamy world flooded with transparent treacle and Vaseline, gloopy and mawkish in the extreme. Apart from, that is, the flashbacks that detail Nolan's betrayal and Mallory's fatal response in the bar, which have some meaningful relevance to the plotline. Duck You Sucker is my least beloved Leone Western, but that doesn't mean I think it's without merit or that it's a failure. Oh no, far from it. Steiger and Coburn work well together, and their on-screen relationship is organically developed, echoing elements of the fractious partnership between Blondie and Tuco in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. Mutual trust and respect fluctuate throughout, and it's got that intriguing and ambiguous edge to it. It's easy to imagine Wallach and Eastwood in the roles, and consider how the dynamic of the film may have been different in that event. The vinegary black humour and wit of the earlier film is missing, however, replaced by something more vulgar, crass and clunky. Eastwood's barbed zingers regrettably absent here. Sure, it's flawed and often erratic, but it's Leone, and Leone deconstructing the mythology of revolution in much the same way as he did with the mythology of the Hollywood Western, employing his distinctive style and creative intelligence to do it. Some of it falls flat, but when it finds its footing, it can almost be as good as his best work on a good day, which is good enough for me in this creatively hollow and vapid age of cinematic bankruptcy. 
Thank you, amigos and amigas. Hope you've managed to claw some meager entertainment value from this review. It's taken me longer to do than anything else to date because of increasing technical difficulties, which I'm learning to live with. Guess if you have to adapt, you can, up to a point anyway. There will be another as soon as I can get it finished, or started, I should say. For the time being, just remember that Via rides, because why walk when you can ride? Soonish, pilgrims.